Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought we would celebrate mothers and daughters everywhere with the upcoming Mother's Day celebration. On the program today, I'd like to welcome our guest, Susan Shapiro Barish. We're going to be talking about her book, You're Grounded Forever, but first, let's go shopping. It's the challenges that mothers face with their daughters and 10 timely solutions that we can go about approaching that. Susan, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Oh, thank you for having me on. How are you? Oh, doing well, thank you. You know, a lot of people don't think about this uh, unless they're mothers who happen to have daughters. And it really is a challenge to be able to raise a daughter without creating what we might perceive to be a monster, somebody that just feels entitled to be doted on hand and foot. Tell us about some of the challenges that mothers face when it comes to raising daughters. Well, it's more difficult today than ever before. Our daughters are influenced by so many outside forces that seem stronger and probably more appealing. You know, celebrity culture, and we've got peer pressure. If your daughter's five years old, she already knows who the it girl in the class is, who the, you know, popular crowd is. And I think that mothers with their own set of values and great determination are just up against too much. Now, tell us about some of the challenges that a mother does face when it comes to a daughter that sort of may seem at times to be out of control, but actually they discover it's a creation on their own. Well, I, you know, it, it is a sort of duo. It's, it's a dance. It's a mother-daughter dance. So what you will have is a daughter who is demanding because you've caved into her needs. So if your daughter says, you know, she's 12 and she wants to be out till midnight and it feels very uncomfortable to you. And you say no and then she keeps on raising her voice and telling you all the other girls do it. Then you say yes and you've handed over your power. Now, it's interesting because when you think about the role of the mother, it's, you know, kind of you're, you're a mother but you're a mentor at the same time. But as you're saying that in your book that Daughters can tend to be unruly, but as you said, you kind of surrender that power because you want to please them. You don't want to be the bad guy. That's kind of a tough situation sometimes. It's really tough, and I I think that the other problem today is that mothers worry about being blamed or deemed a bad mother or a mother who's not hip enough or not with the program, and the daughter's keenly aware of that. Mothers judge one another. It's just a sort of endless mothering situation you start early and you know your daughter's 30 years old and you're still mothering her (laughs) and that's really that's what was so fascinating about this study because i spoke with women all across the country whether their daughters were three till over 35 and virtually every mother said to me i feel like i could have done better i feel like i should have been stronger had more power guided my daughter better and at the same time everyone has the best intentions Mm mm-hmm now that that's just it. I, I remember a, a friend of mine who uh, she's got a teenage daughter. I think she's uh, fourteen, and she uh-huh. says, "God, she Half always age. needs this. She needs that. I've got to take her here. I've got to take her there." I said, "You know, why don't you get this girl to start doing things for herself?" She says, "I don't know how I go about doing that." <laughs> well, that's why I wrote this book mm-hmm. because I felt like we needed a guidebook for what you know. The subtitle is "The Ten Challenges Mothers Face." Because, you know, talking about those challenges, because we indulge our daughters materially, we don't have enough boundaries, we make too many excuses for them, and so it goes. We just, you know, all, again, as I said, with the best intentions. The mm-hmm. mothers today feel overwhelmed. Many of them work. If you have, say, three daughters, you come home after a long day at work, and all three daughters are asking for something. Some mothers say they cave in just because they're too exhausted. Well, yeah, fighting with a young girl just isn't easy. (laughs) No, and it doesn't end. And that's the part that so interested me is why the mothers feel they have no voice, why they feel that their daughters just drown them out, why they say yes when they mean no. And why they do when they shouldn't. Well, for instance, um, I don't know if you know, but a few weeks ago um, Abercrombie and Fitch, which sells a lot of clothing to young girls and boys, came out with this push-up bikini for 7- to 14-year-old girls. Oh, brother. 
And, yeah, it's called the Ashley Bikini. And what does a mother do if every young girl, every nine-year-old girl in her daughter's crowd, if you will, gets that bikini and the mother feels very strongly that this isn't right. She doesn't want her daughter in a push-up bikini at the age of nine. Is there no childhood left? And she looks like a killjoy and her daughter feels, this is the worst, disenfranchised from the other girls because she doesn't have the right bathing suit. Mm-hmm. I know that's the one thing about daughters, or at least girls, you know, they're, it's really important for them to be accepted into their peer group no matter what it takes. Even and if a lot of, be, right. Yeah. And a lot of mothers bend over backwards and just say yes because they don't want their daughters to feel that they're not in with the group or that they're somehow singled out for not being hip enough. And mm-hmm. until we feel strong enough about our own beliefs to say no to our daughters or to say I'm not comfortable with that, then the daughters probably have too much power and the mothers have no authority. Mm -hmm. I know what was interesting uh, in your book is that you talk about how uh, ego-driven mothers, for instance, uh, if they may not have enough self-esteem, they tend to live and allow that to happen through their daughters. Explain why that happens. Well, that's, yeah, one of the scenarios that's unfortunate. Perhaps the mother has a daughter who is really very, very popular and thought out, and the mother never had that kind of life, and so she lives vicariously through her daughter. That's one scenario. Another is where a mother was very narcissistic and popular herself, and one of her daughters is just like that. Mm -hmm. So she's drawn to that daughter because it's like reliving what she had when she was younger. Or we just pin our hopes to our daughters. You know, we say, oh, you know, you should be, be a professional and you should have a great marriage, and all of that is great if you're not pressuring your daughter because you feel that you somehow lost out. Mm-hmm. You know, and especially when it comes to relationships, if a mother happens to become a single mother, you know, then there tends to be that situation where mother t- kind of takes over, takes a lot of the blame for why a relationship doesn't work out, and it seems to me that there might even be a feeding frenzy with a daughter saying, you know, you're right, you were wrong. So now you're going to spend the rest of your life appeasing me to be sure that, you know, that this doesn't happen again. And if a mother gets into a new relationship, oh, my goodness, what can happen then? <laughs> well, yes, there is, you know, I have a whole chapter in the book devoted to families, you know, whether it's mm-hmm. a single mother, remarried mother, never married mother, nuclear family, step family. And each of these families works if it's a very stable, safe, and protective environment for the daughters. But if a mother's single and she's dating a lot and the daughter picks up on how the mother feels about it, that might not make the daughter feel very safe. Now, do you feel that sometimes that perhaps we can be a little too critical of uh, of daughters as far as mothers are concerned? Yes, and I think that's really unfortunate. I think that to be critical in particular about beauty and weight can make it very difficult for the daughter. Mm-hmm. I interviewed one mother who told me that her her 10-year-old daughter was, you know, already overweight and that the mother bought her a food scale and was very critical of her diet. That's that's really a slippery slope. We have to wow. be a lot less intense and n- not critical of our daughters, more understanding of who they are as individuals. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm kind of curious then, what does it take for a mother to have the wherewithal to raise, I guess, a healthy young woman to actually have a healthy sense of self, so to speak, without caving in to all of the desires that may be coming to them through outside forces, so to speak? I found that the mothers who were balanced in their own lives and had a very strong set of values but would also take the time to listen to their daughters. And if the daughter said, but this is so important to me, the mother would pick and choose. What, what, where she would sort of bend for her daughter and where she simply couldn't. Mm-hmm. And again, <clears throat> where there was a balance through it, then the daughter felt uh, good enough about herself. And of course, you know, if your mother's really unhappy, the, do- the daughter absorbs that the mothers are the first and lasting models for their daughters. So if the mother herself is unhappy, the daughter really picks up on that. If the mother decides to stay married and it's a contentious marriage, then the daughter really wonders if she'll ever be happily in love. So everything the mother does is really scrutinized and absorbed by the daughter. 
Mm-hmm. That kind of seems to be a rough road. Oh, listen, I mean, growing up female in America is filled with possibility, but also very hard in some ways. I mean, women are still paid 75 cents on the dollar. One woman said to me, she was a lawyer, she said that, her daughter saw her work long hours, hit the glass ceiling, never get paid a dollar for a dollar, and that it really had an effect. Her daughter said to her, when I grow up, I don't want to work as hard as you. I don't want to end up divorced and, you know, never getting to be where I should be with all that talent. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, it, it's it's a bit tricky for women still, for females. Yeah, I can see how, especially in America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where it should be filled with opportunity. Mm-hmm. When the White House report came out in March, you know, Women's History Month, and they reported, I thought it was up to 78 cents on the dollar, but the report came out that you, if you're female, you get paid 75 cents on the dollar. And I kept being interviewed, and everyone kept saying to me, how do you explain it? And I said, you can't explain it. It's such a form of bias, but it's terrible for our daughters. It's really terrible for the daughter to know that. It doesn't make her want to run out and do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Sort of feeling the sense that I should just be able to have it handed to me, kind of a thing, or is that right? Sort or of why the should I work? Well, it's sort of like the pendulum swing. It's the boomer mothers, the Gen X mothers, have had great careers, and you know, some of the mothers said that their daughters, who are in their twenties now, don't want to work as hard as the mother. They don't want to end up with that, you know, being stressed and pulled in a million directions. So it's it's really interesting how these daughters and what will they raise their daughters as? One mother said that her twenty-five year old daughter said to her. I'm going to be much stricter with my daughter than you have been with me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right, so here we are trying to please these daughters, <clears throat> doing somersaults for the daughters. Whatever they want, we jump high enough to give it to them. And then our daughters are saying, hmm, I don't know, you were too lenient. You were, you spoiled me. I'm not doing that. It's just so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Makes really you wonder why you want to be a mother of a daughter sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you know, the gender identity is very strong. Yeah. You know, all the mothers said, oh, the day my daughter was born, I had my daughter, I had a girl. And that really is compelling. I mean, personally, I have two daughters and a son, and I know what it's like to raise daughters. It's it's really challenging, but, it, you know, that gender identity, we're all mm-hmm. in it together. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me, Susan, so what are the solutions that you can offer for mothers out there? So is it ever too late, I guess? I mean, you know, you're you're taking a look at a situation. I remember I'm a father of a daughter, and, uh, you know, you can just see the intelligence exuding out of this young child, even at the age of one and a half, two years old. You have a daughter that old? What's that? No, no, not now. She's actually 22. So. Oh, okay. So she's right. So she's close to my daughter's but the, age. Yeah there, was, daughters, yeah. yeah, there was a point, actually, that she was, you know, uh, saying, you know, I kind of got kicked out of the house. I'm on my own now. And I was always of the uh, opinion that you raise your children to become independent, you know, to be able to make good decisions for themselves. And sometimes, you know, there are situations that you realize, well, I know this is going to be a little rough, but you're just going to have to bite the bullet and take a shot. But I remember that as uh, she lived with us for a small bit, that she was basically saying, you know, I'm going to go ahead and live here. I'm not going to contribute. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to do whatever I want, and I'm going to make your wife miserable. You know, and I was like, this (laughs) just isn't going to work too well, I don't think. Here's a 30-day notice. Why don't you go think about those rules somewhere else was my attitude. But I can see where being a mother couldn't be easy to do something like that. Well, first of all, mothers, feel very beholden to their daughters. Mm-hmm. Almost every mother in my study said that if her daughter came home after college, and you know more um, college graduates live at home, boys and girls in mm-hmm. America now than ever before. Oh, yeah. But And it's the downturn, and it's the way we've coddled them and the helicopter parenting. It's all of the above. But what what the mothers told me across, just across the board, they said, you know, if my daughter comes home, she can stay till she needs to go. Or so she can, needs to go. That's right, interesting. Or t- chooses to go. But my son, he's got six months. Right. So you see, it's very sexist. We feel the need to protect our daughters in a different way than our sons. Mm-hmm. And that was something that really struck me in this study. Mm-hmm. Now, why is that? We still live in a very patriarchal culture. I still think that there's more opportunity and a, a, a fair sense 
that you can have whatever, you know, that there's more that will be fair for a boy. And I think that girls seem more vulnerable. And yet they're out there very early, as you know, if you have a 22-year-old. And mm. I even the difference between my daughter, who's 30, who I must say is getting married next week, and my daughter, who's 23, such a difference in how they were raised. I mean, by the time the younger one, who's close to your daughter's age, I mean, they were going out with groups of boys when they were like 12 and 14. Right. So it's just very slick and fast for them, and you feel this constant need to protect them. Mm-hmm. Well, they could actually do that pretty well on their own, right? Yes. I mean, you know, look, I've been a professor all these years in New York City at Marymount Manhattan College, and a lot of the parenting has changed, and there's been a lot written about it what they call helicopter parenting. So when your kid goes off to college, you know, if they have a problem, the parents jump right in. That's a very new way. You know, they'll call it the administrator. You know, it's different than it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago where the kids were more on their own. So we're re- we really have to ask ourselves, are we helping or hindering our daughters <coughs> by by not really spinning them into the world, feeling, as you said earlier, independent and capable? Mm-hmm. Because they really need to have those skills to get out in the world, and it's a tough world. Well, you know, there's no doubt about that, and I think that women actually handle criticism a lot harder than men do. I mean, you know, we kind of get our wounds, we lick them, and we kind of get back up, and we go and we do our thing. But for women, when that happens, I've noticed, you know, they tend to really hold on to that, and they really can take it personally. And you can see why, for instance, a mother having a daughter who may get out there and stumble a little bit then comes back and says, well, I just can't do it, you know, tends to say, oh, you can, but let's just give it some time rather than saying, well, get back out there and do it again. Oh, there's a lot of that. And I interviewed one woman who said that her daughter, you know, got, came home from college, couldn't get a job for months, living at home, finally got a job, and told her mother she had a mean boss. And mm-hmm. the mother, you know, what would you say? I would say, well, hey, who hasn't had a mean boss? But the mother encouraged her daughter to quit. Well, no, we want our daughters to be ambitious. We want our daughters to be able to make money in a capitalistic society and to tough it out. Mm-hmm. So we have to be very careful. I, and, again, you know, everyone wants to make it the best possible scenario for their daughter, but we also need to really think of what will help them in the long run. So what's a good way that, let's say, a mother listening to this program today, that they could get started on that path to sort of, for lack of a better scenario, toughen the girl up and say, you know, you can do this? Well, we have to really think of what the the big picture is, the big message for our daughter, whether they're 3, 13, 23. It's never too late to, you know, keep to, – to, to even say, look, things are changing. I feel that perhaps I've been too cushy or, you know, I've made it too easy for you. You've got to really buck up. But also your values. What are your values? What what modeling do you give to your daughter? And to really keep communicating. And uh, to me, the most important pieces of it are that you're not materialistic. But, you know, of course, as I said, we live in a capitalistic society. But that, you, you know, you're not shopping, like, to drown the pain. You're not shopping and spending more money than you make, that whatever you do with your daughter is healthy, that you're not telling her she needs to lose 10 pounds and pressuring her. You're not emphasizing beauty. You're not competing with your daughter. There's none of that who looks best in these genes. I mean, we really have to be the mother figure. We're an authority figure. We're not our daughter's best friend. Right. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's interesting that you know that you want that what you sh- seems that you should do is to give your kids the love that they that they need, you know, to give them the attention that they deserve, but at the same time to be you, you know, to yes. show those vulnerabilities that you have as well as the strengths and be comfortable about both of those things. Do you think it gets a little bit easier then? <clears throat> That there are stages that are just predictably difficult with daughters. It mm-hmm. seems to start, based on my research, earlier than ever. I mean, mothers spoke to me, and again, all across the country, all different aged mothers and social strata, big towns and rural areas, cities, but virtually every mother was saying that her daughter was growing up so quickly mm-hmm. and that she was so involved with her friends, almost to the exclusion of you know family, 
where she would be so invested in her friendships, and the girls were like in third grade and fourth grade. So it <laughs> happens, right? So it happens very quickly, and then the daughters hit what they call emerging adulthood, where it's like they turn 22 and they see how tough the world is, and suddenly no one wants to be slick and fast and grown up anymore. Mm-hmm. So you struggle with all these issues, curfew, boys, the way they dress, all these issues from like 12 till about 18. They go off to college, hopefully, that's really important, get an education, and then suddenly they aren't very focused. So we really need to get our girls focused. I think it's important to talk about ambition and how to have a career that satisfies you and how to earn money and feel good about yourself from an early age, really, so mm-hmm. that they're prepared for the world. You know, it's interesting as a male uh, and reading your books, you're grounded forever, but first let's go shopping. Is that You see some of the scenarios that you have uh, described in the book. You know, as a man, you take a look at that and you go, well, you know, there's a common sense approach to this. You know, what are you doing here? But you realize, well, this is also a woman's point of view, so it's not so right. easy because women in this society, and, and this goes back a long time, you know, uh, you know, post-industrial age, if you will, is that, you know, they stay at home, they're happy, you know, nobody ever, you're listening to everybody else's day, but nobody could care less about what the woman's day was like, you know. Take a look at the Ozzy and Harriet situation, for instance. But over the years, that really, in fact, even before then, had really changed where women actually had a voice. It was a matter of getting it out and, you know, and showing that, you know, this is just another person that feels, has a hard day, has a good day, whatever the case is, just like anybody else does, uh, to be heard. But it seems that there was a lot of conditioning that kind of conditioned us to believe that uh, that needs to be suppressed and that they're always going to be happy and pleasing everyone. And that's that's an impossible place for anybody to be, regardless (laughs) if you're a male or a female. Right. I think that the way that women 50 years ago, 60 years ago, were expected to behave, if you will, Mm -hmm. was pretty limiting. And that's why Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique and described these women as suffering from the, quote, unquote, the problem that has no name. And that was this incredible boredom and sense that there was nothing really for them except to cook dinners and drive your children in station wagons. So when life changed and the world opened up for women through the workplace, it offered tremendous opportunity, and we want our daughters to have those opportunities. But like I said, it's complicated too because every study shows that even if you make more money than your spouse, than your husband, that when you come home, that second shift is still yours where you do everything for your child, even though you've worked as long a day as your husband. So there's a lot of sexist stuff still going on. And then there's a whole backlash to the future, which I would call sort of like a daughter who's your daughter's age, who says, wait a second, I don't need to work that hard. Let me marry a guy who has a great career. Let me have a much more (laughs) glamorous life, right? Right. And my message in this book is no. Husbands come, they go, they die. You know, you've got to be Mm self-sufficient. And if, you know, raise your daughter, of course, to fit in in every way and you know oh, there's so much emphasis on beauty and weight and all the glittering prizes the right boyfriend who becomes the right husband but ultimately you want your daughters to have tremendous self-esteem and you want them to be really capable well there's no doubt about that i mean my mother raised uh three of us and that's three boys uh and you know she came home after a long day and uh would say i'm going to teach you how to cook <laughs> you know, this is the way it works. She and she it got like to a point that actually where she says, now I want you cooking dinner, and I want you to go ahead and make out a menu for the week, and I'm going to be sure to go and buy the groceries, but that's your job. And she told me years later, she says, the reason that I taught you to do a lot of these things, you know, which is cooking, cleaning, ironing, you name it. Wow, pretty is liberated she, mother, pretty cool. Oh, yeah, very much. Very and cool. uh, what was interesting, she says, I wanted you to know how to do these things, and this is what she said, so you wouldn't have to marry somebody to do them for you. And it was funny when she said that because I thought, why would I want to marry somebody to do this stuff for me? But apparently that actually goes on. (laughs) I think it's it's changing. And, you know, there, there was that big article in Newsweek a few months back called Who Needs Marriage? 
And in reading that, some of these issues that you're describing were, were a part of the piece because the the idea that you marry and everyone has a very relegated role that you know wives take care of the home and do simple things like iron shirts and cook stew and that you raise your daughters to be good wives and your sons to go out into the world. You know, all of that sort of pigeonholing has changed. And one reason that I wrote this book about how we raise our daughters today is because it's so different than how we were raised. Sure. It's just so different. And, you know, mothers just keep wanting to be their daughter's friends. And it, you, you simply must be the authority figure. And you can be close with your daughter, and obviously communication is key. But really, until your daughter is over 20 or 25, you have to have a hierarchical relationship where you're the boss, where you offer her your wisdom and guidance. And even if that takes a little bit of tears and pain, so be it, because it's going to be exactly. a lot worse if you don't. <laughs> right, and if you just keep saying yes, if you, then you're creating your own monster. And because your daughter doesn't really want a curfew of 1 a.m. when she's 14, even though she tells you and she pushes all those buttons. One mother said to me, now her daughter's 20-something, and she said, why do you let me stay out so late? It mm. was horrible for me. You know, the mother really has to step up to the plate. She really has to be strong and very convinced of her own sensibility. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the question for me then is, where do you feel that mothers, and we're not saying all of them, but but you know your book does address a, a crowd of women out there who you know obviously need to be identified with having these rough problems with their daughters going on where do you feel that that they lost their power where did that go i i believe based on what the women said to me mm-hmm. and remember again a very disparate group of women that they remembered their own childhood and awkward moments and unhappy times and vowed that their daughters would never endure that. Mm -hmm. So hoping to really assuage the pain for their daughters, they ended up giving them much too much power and not enough rules, not enough boundaries. I mean, one woman told me a mother said that her daughter had a math test and she was very worried about it. She called her, you know, she called her daughter from work, and the daughter said, I'm home, and I'm like, you know, I, my stomach's in knots, and tomorrow's the test. The mother said, well, let me call in, and I'll call in and say you're sick, and you can have an extra day to study. Well, you know, it's enticing in the moment, but it's not really helping your daughter. That's how we go wrong. Mm-hmm. Or one mother told me that her six-year-old wanted her hair keratin straightened, Brazilian straightened, because her older stepsister had it. And the mother said to the daughter, of course not. And the daughter said, please, I want it, I want it, I hate my hair. Well, if your daughter hates her hair at six, I mean, you know, you've really got to, you know, go through the whole unpleasant motion of explaining to her that six-year-olds don't get their hair Brazilian straightened. Mm -hmm. And some mothers just think it's easier to cut corners, but it isn't in the long run. You have to stand tough. And I myself found it so hard. I remember when my older daughter wanted a certain book bag. And when we got to the store, it was so expensive. And I said to her, why do you want this? Everybody has it, she said. Haven't we all heard that as mothers? <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. But, but, okay, but she was 16. By the time my little one, who's seven years younger, wanted the right book bag, she was 12, 9, 10. You know, like it happened so much earlier. So this is what we're up against. I, mm. I mean, these girls are so influenced by celebrity culture. I, I remember years ago, every one of my students, freshmen in college, all the female students had pierced belly buttons. Well, that was because Britney Spears was the it girl, and she had a pierced belly button. Mm-hmm. So what's a mother to do? I mean, where you have to pick and choose your battles. Mm-hmm. That would certainly be one to say, yeah, I don't mind you having a pierced belly button when you're 18 and when you pay for it. <laughs> right, exactly. But it, but what if you really can't bear the idea that your daughter does that? Mm-hmm. Then she'll probably sneak around and do it. Mm-hmm. And I and this is what we're up against. We keep saying, well, it's only a pierced belly button. Well, it's only a very, you know, like a mini skirt. It's only a push-up bikini. 
and she's nine that we were talking about before. So you keep on rationalizing, but mm-hmm. but then you end up losing your voice. By degrees, definitely. And some of the mothers with whom I spoke for this study who were very tough said that there had been some really unpleasant moments, but that they felt very comfortable with who they were. Mm-hmm. They said, I don't need to be just adored. Of course I need to be loved. But I really need to say that this is the rule in this house. Those mothers are impressive. That's but not too many example. are like that. Mm-hmm. The book is your grounded forever, but first let's go shopping. Our guest today, Susan Shapiro Barish. You know, not an easy road, but certainly one that if you you know find and do the right things, especially with our daughters, that they're going to come back to you one day and say, you know, I was glad that you did that. You know, because my friend's mother didn't, and look how she turned out. <laughs> exactly, that's right. So we have to really believe in ourselves. We have mm-hmm. to have you know, in those dark hours when you're really doubting yourself, you have to say what kind of mother am I and what is my message to my daughter Mm -hmm. and it should be to think for yourself yes and to understand who your daughter you know like if your daughter is really a klutz and all the other little girls and all the other six year olds are in ballet school and your daughter is just miserable doing that on Saturday well then you have to say to her what would you like to do instead have to you know instead of saying but all the girls do it so you know we have to be very individual too Mm mm-hmm Fascinating stuff. Susan, thank you for joining us here on the thank Beyond you for 50 Radio Program. Me on. You bet. Do I, why don't you go ahead and give out a website people can find out more? It's Susan Shapiro com, And I love it when people get in touch with me at the website. I'll get back in touch right away. Well, they can certainly do that, and they should, especially if they've got somebody who's just going crazy. I know there's a friend <laughs> of mine who started uh, dating uh, someone that she is really enjoying, and she happens to have this 13 year old or he happens to have this 13-year-old daughter that lives with him, and he does very well for himself. And, oh, man, some of the things she's saying, you know, it's like they'll be sitting in the middle of a movie, and all of a sudden, we need to go and get that new purse for me. End of discussion. Well, you go ahead and you you leave, but this, you know, dad just seems to do that. They'll actually get up in the middle of a movie, and they'll go. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? (laughs) <laughs> but you see, that's why I wrote this book. Exactly. So it's good for men as well, definitely. Right. Fathers <laughs> can learn a lot, too, because the idea here is that we have to have boundaries. Exactly. That's a great story about not enough boundaries. Thank you for having me on. You bet. What a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. We also thank you, the listeners, for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50, and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. I'm Daniel Davis. Again, thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway.